I think some people would like to think that I've had this sort of since childhood kind of desperate urge to build an Iron Man suit or a desperate urge to fly like a bird or something. No, not really. I mean, I, I you know, like, like any creative or imaginative person, you know, you look at what a bird can do, or you look at the sky, and, or you look at a jet fighter, and, you know, it's hard not to be inspired and amazed by what those creations do. I'm Christopher Lawson. And I'm Andrew Moon. And this time on Moonshot, we're taking off into the world of aerial transport to see just how far away we are from being able to fly everywhere we go. So sit down and buckle up. We've got flying cars, drone transport and jetpacks all up ahead. get an idea of the thrust here when I try and hold them horizontally and somewhat fail. That's around 50 kilos of thrust there. Uh, so we were quite impressed with that. We thought we were getting somewhere. So there's, there's only one sensible way to go from there. You get four. So this really started um, in a very amateur kind of way around February, March 2016. Alongside a day job, I've had a 15-year career as a commodity trader, alongside spending six years in the Royal Marines Reserve and also time um, uh, scaling a startup as well alongside a day job. So I'm a bit of a glutton for interesting challenges. Um, and this particular challenge that inspired me was around uh, human flight. Could you, um, in, you know, could you imagine a, a whole new realm of human flight by taking an approach where you would augment the human mind and body with elegant technology rather than put the human mind and body, you know, the human being, inside a flight machine. Richard Browning is the founder of Gravity, a UK company building a real-life jetpack. And while jetpacks have notoriously been a thing of the future, Browning is making really good progress. He launched the company in 2016 and the Gravity team achieved their first flight within the year. That, um, that first and second flight, albeit quite crude, um, Came about pretty quick because in the intervening months we'd just gone through a ruthless process of learning from trying and learning from falling over and failing. Um, we'd spent less time, frankly, if I'm really honest, researching the theory of what should work because I was mindful that by researching the theory you are digesting mostly what is considered to be status quo thinking. Um, you know, you can't really research what's not been done before. Um, so taking that approach uh, and being very practical and repurposing existing technology and existing equipment as far as possible just allowed us to make super quick progress. Richard has been posting a lot of his progress videos online. And when you're watching the clips, there's a very real feeling that this technology is highly experimental. In one of the clips, Richard has his arms strapped to a couple of small jet engines, and then he turns them on, and you see the immense power of these engines, which look like they're about to knock him over. I'd say we, we were pretty cautious, first of all. So um, I've, got, I've got the very first Mark I engine mount, which is built like a tank. Uh, it's an enormously heavily armor-plated kind of aluminium thing that's about 9 mil thick. And I gingerly, you know, having bench tested the engine and gosh, the first time you fire one of these things up, I mean, it's some of the figures, I mean, even though it's the size of a biscuit tin uh, it's, and it weighs 1.8 kilos, it's putting out 23 kilos of thrust, which is enough to tip a washing machine. It was also my first test bed. <laughs> um, uh, and the air is exiting at Mach 1.5. Uh, it's about 115, 120 decibels. Um, it's just, you can feel the air sucking in into the, you know, the front of it, even if you're standing a meter away or so, you can kind of feel the cold air kind of going past you on the way into the engine. I mean, they are, they are something to behold. So yes, I had a deep respect for when I then made the decision to have a go at kind of holding one of these. But as I say, with the very armor plated arm mount, it became quite obvious within a couple of goes that actually, yes, it's very noisy and a big ball of energy, but it's highly manageable. What's required like from a physical standpoint, to be able to fly one of one of these jetpacks? Um, so I, I would say that the physical demands are lessening with every iteration that we make now. But certainly in the early days, in the R&D phase, it leaned very heavily on my, I guess, 
lucky break that was I'd been doing a lot of ultra marathon running, so I was pretty lean and light. And I've been doing a lot of this calisthenics training, mm. uh, which is, you know, like flags and muscle ups and, you know, rolling up into handstands. But the nice thing is that they don't bulk you up very much. You don't end up with, you know, massive muscle bound weight. Um, you end up with lean strength, but also lean strength in multiple planes. Richard Browning is hardly the first person to set his mind to building a jetpack. They are as much a cultural icon of the future as they are a potential way for us all to get around. Some of the ideas behind jetpacks go back decades, even as early as the 1920s and 30s. But it wasn't until the 60s that any real progress began. There are videos online, and you can find them on YouTube, that show a demonstration of Bell Aircraft's jetpack called the Rocket Belt. Now undergoing feasibility tests for the Army is a unique rocket belt which permits the user to fly through the air, scale cliffs, and cross rivers and chasms. Now, because of restrictions on the amount of fuel it could carry, it couldn't get very far, but that didn't matter. The jetpack had captured the world's attention. America's crack airborne divisions demonstrated latest battle techniques under the eye of the nation's commander-in-chief, President Kennedy. But the man with a rocket-assisted flying belt, calmly crossing a hundred yards of water as if by magic, nearly stole the show. So much so that even James Bond got one in 1965, with Sean Connery using a jetpack to escape in Thunderball. And there's of course the famous moment in the 1984 Olympics, where a jetpack was used to fly across the stadium in the opening ceremony. But when it comes to designing and developing jetpacks, it's actually a fairly difficult process, which is why we're not all currently flying around with one strapped to our back. And if we're looking at modern companies in this space right now, there's been a lot of hype around the Martin jetpack, designed in New Zealand by Glenn Martin. It's big and bulky, and progress on the jetpack has been really slow due to the complexity of making these things, and it's forced many investors to simply call it quits. Then there's US stuntman Troy Hartman. Today I'll be flying with my own personal jetpack. Who's been building his own version of the jetpack. And then you've got Astro Teller, captain of Alphabet's Moonshot division. Now for those following at home, Alphabet is the parent company of Google. Now he said the jetpacks aren't on their radar, even after some initial research, because they just aren't viable when you look at how much distance you get for the cost. But progress with new technologies like jetpacks doesn't come without a lot of failure. And even though Gravity is still a young company, that process of experimentation and failure hasn't stopped Richard from wanting to make his jetpack a reality. There's been lots of falls from, you know, a metre or so up, um, but that's partly why I wear all that padded kind of body armour. Um, I managed to clonk myself in the face uh, when I lost an engine in front of German national TV, which um, just resulted in bleeding a bit on one of their GoPros. Uh, that was probably the most uh, dramatic, but it wasn't, it wasn't really much. Um, I, I, I've fallen quite heavily before and felt some shock through my collarbone. I do predict that if I have a bad fall at some point, it might, you know, bust my collarbone or my wrist or my ankle or something. Um, you know, I, I'd liken this to um, riding a kind of dirt bike really aggressively over a kind of, you know, jumpy kind of terrain. You know, if if I get one of those jumps wrong, or in the case of in the case of this system, if I get an unplanned failure, something fails, you know, I'm going to fall a meter or two, maybe badly twist something or whatever. But really, you know, I haven't I haven't done any of that. I've fallen all the time from really quite low level. Um, you know, it, it, safe, safety is critical. Here. There's no prizes for going and jiggering yourself. The system's got the capability to go hundreds of miles an hour and thousands of feet up in the air, but. You know, I'm not going to prove much by going and doing that. Day 11, test 37, configuration 2.0. In three, two, one. Richard's jetpack suit often reminds people of Tony Stark from the Iron Man films. So I wanted to ask him about that comparison. I, I mean, the, the comparison is lovely. It, I, I love the fact that the closest analogy uh, that, that the members of the public can kind of give Iron Man, that, that, you know, when they... When, when they see this online or see, let alone see this in person, the closest, you know, it's quite cool to have the closest analogy to being that, you know, inspirational, seemingly impossible kind of superhero character. Uh, you know, I'm, I can't deny that's quite fun to have that, uh, have that uh, you know, association. 
Uh, and in some ways, I've ended up generating a deep respect for the ability for science fiction to shine a light on, I suppose, unencumbered human creativity. Well, if you look back at what they did in Star Trek 10 years ago, we got half of the things that they were talking about and showing then. And, and, and it's funny how, you know, the technology seems to take a leaf out of science fiction books. So, so I, I've got more of a healthy respect than I used to have, I have to say, for, uh, you know, what you see, let's say, in the Iron Man film. And actually, you know, I can't deny we now still look at some of the capability of what you see in that film. Of course, it's not real. Uh, and wonder to what extent we can match it. And actually, I can tell you, we are matching behind the scenes a lot more than anybody's seen online so far. And we'll be back with more Moonshot in a moment. Now, when it comes to personal flight, jetpacks aren't the only sci-fi way of getting around town. For almost as long as there have been planes in the sky, people have had the dream of one day being able to own a flying car. And thanks to recent developments and a huge investment in aerospace companies, it seems that now might just be the start of the flying car era. Enter Pal V. Well, my name is Mark Jennings Bates and I'm the Vice President of Sales for Pal V North America. So we're rolling out the flying car in North America. It's a pretty exciting opportunity. And Pal V is a corporation that we started several years ago now to develop the world's first commercially feasible flying car which is nothing new. We've been trying for 100 years to do that, and it really is not that complicated to invent a flying car. But then to take the next step and commercialize it is actually really complicated. And we've seen several variants of cars that have flown. Um, And for one reason or another, whether it's public appeal or whether it just is not commercially feasible, they don't exist today. They're all museum pieces. So the real complex puzzle was to create a vehicle that could fly, a car that could fly, or a plane that could drive, that met regulatory guidelines that we operate with today and could be commercially adapted to a business that would function profitably. That has been a, a very difficult puzzle to solve and that's uh, that's kept our, our offices back in the Netherlands very, very busy. PAL V, which stands for Personal Air and Land Vehicle, is a Dutch company that's building a flying car that kind of resembles a helicopter. Although the company says it's actually closer to a gyroplane. You can drive it along the road like a car and then take it to your nearest airport and switch over to flight mode. But while on paper the process sounds quite simple, the differences between flying and driving make the process a little more time consuming. I can tell you that it's virtually a push button process. We'll do probably 85% of what you need to do to fly. So you can press a button and watch it happen and then get out of the car and do a couple of things. So that turns the car into an aircraft. However, we just moved into a new domain. We're now pilots. We're not a driver anymore. We're a pilot. And a pilot must, by law, do a pre-flight inspection of their aircraft before they leave at the beginning of the day. So every day we go through a pre-flight inspection. For some people, it might take half an hour. For other people, if they're new to the process, it might actually take an hour. Um, It certainly gets easier, but it still should always remain a checklist process. The way to avoid accidents is to use a checklist and not memorize the checklist because that's when we tend to overlook something important. According to the company, the PAL-V will have a range of around 1,300 kilometers when on the ground and reach speeds of around 160 kilometers per hour. In the air, it can also fly for around three and a half hours and reach around 12,000 feet. The PAL-V also has twin engines, which the company says is the first time this has been offered in a gyroplane. What that means for us is if we have catastrophic failure of one engine, we can still fly not in the same manner. We don't have the same performance, but we have a 10 to 1 glide ratio to be able to find a place to land with one engine. If we lose both engines, we have a 5.5 to 1 glide ratio, so we can easily pick a landing spot which we, is very small for a gyroplane, and we can land safely and figure out what just went wrong. So that's the, the safety aspect is provided by the, the design of the gyroplane platform within the flying car. The simplicity, if you talk to a gyroplane flying instructor, they'll tell you that their students tend to solo much quicker than students of a fixed wing aircraft because a gyroplane is so very simple to fly. 
not necessarily easy and it doesn't mean that uh, you know we don't have students who have, find it challenging but on average you'll find that gyroplane students will solo sometimes after only several hours of flight training and I know typically in a fixed wing you might have 14 or 15 hours of um, flight training before you actually solo so we can get people really into a deep learning environment with the gyroplane much more quickly and it's not complex to, to go through the process of learning and then Finally, getting your license and learning to fly cross country in a gyroplane. And what, what, what sort of what sort of like the time frame of when you know people will be able to purchase these and and actually you know be able to fly them? Yeah, you bet. So we're pre-selling now, and the intention is that uh, we will start deliveries to clients in 2018. Pal V are selling two models of their flying car. The sport version will sell for four hundred thousand US dollars, and they also have a limited edition version that sells for almost six hundred thousand. And while Pal V might be one of the closest to getting their vehicles to market, there are a lot of other companies building flying vehicles and using vastly different technology. There are foldable wing cars, multicopters, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, or VTOL paragliding cars, personal hover vehicles, and some that use a mix of ideas like Pal-V. Companies like Uber have also been investing heavily in VTOL technology, they kind of resemble drones, and it appears Dubai might be one of the first cities to allow real-world trials of the technology at scale. But given all this interest in flying vehicles, there's really only one question left. Why don't we all own one yet? I think maybe up until the last five to 10 years or so, there was maybe mostly a focus on building uh, some sort of vehicle that could both fly and be driven on the road, um, which was never really sort of a practical uh, approach to take to this uh, from an engineering standpoint, um, because there was just too many uh, regulations and too many sort of uh, technological hurdles to overcome to make something like that work. This is Andrew Hawkins. He's a transportation reporter for The Verge. In recent, more recent times, we saw a lot of breakthroughs and innovations in um, sort of the material, uh, the, the composite material that we that would be used to make these these vehicles, as well as things like um, autonomy and battery technology uh, improving on a, a a much greater scale. And I think that that sort of led a lot of folks. Uh, to believe, hey, maybe something uh, like these um, these personalized aircraft was would be would actually be possible. Uh, and then you had innovations like like ride sharing and ride hailing, Uber and Lyft and other uh, of those types of companies come along and sort of put into people's heads that there was this uh, you know this possibility or maybe this um, this uh, 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 that this could be translated over into uh, into flight. Uh, and I think the third component is that you have uh, traffic patterns just being uh, increasingly worse across the globe, uh, and pollution obviously uh, as a um, as a byproduct of that. And people are just getting fed up with being stuck in uh, in traffic and not being able to go anywhere, especially in uh, in urban centers. And so there was a lot of folks that thought, hey, this would be a a good idea, a good way to sort of circumvent that to. Uh, to act to literally fly above traffic and to get uh, folks uh, you know between uh, you know city centers and the airport or to points sort of dis more distant than that and you know and, and now we're seeing a lot more serious thought and serious serious interest from everywhere from you know uh, the uh, space agency NASA in the US uh, to giant companies like Uber and even uh, you know uh, automotive companies like Volvo taking a great interest in this. So I think that there, it, there's definitely a shift that's going on from oh this is some sort you know this is sort of a uh, symbolizes the future if you sort of comp uh, put it in the same category as as jetpacks or space elevators these sort of futuristic fantastical ideas that would never actually come to fruition and now we're actually starting to see some sort of meaningful development. According to Aerospace Accelerator Starburst, there has been more than 200 million US dollars invested in flying cars to date, a small figure in comparison to how large the market could be. Starburst are hoping there will one day be a SpaceX of flying cars and say that the ideal solution is to have an autonomous vehicle which has the capability of driving through a city and then can switch to flight mode and continue the journey. 
Francois Chapar is the CEO and founder of Starburst and says he can see a solid business case for the future of the flying vehicle market. What we've seen now, and it was not obvious even two years ago, is that all the technology already, uh, uh, everybody agrees on the the potential architecture, the fact that it would be electric, uh, where you put the engines and everything. So technology is ready and that's really important because now we we can talk about regulation, certification and uh, insertion into the um, airspace. Um, When you look at this, there's a huge difference between just Europe and the US. Um, Europe is very regulated. You can't fly everywhere. There's a lot of restrictions. You, for example, you can't fly uh, above Paris for any reason, which is not the case in the US. LA, you can fly with um, a very simple helicopters almost uh, all around the town. San Francisco is the same. Um, so, and then when you look at Sao Paulo, you can uh, even land on, uh, on buildings uh, almost everywhere and you have a lot of uh, helicopters. Uh, so already the, the you know the regulation is very different from uh, one region to another, one city to another. So we're going to see um, cities that will advance um, and and go much quicker on that subject than others. Uh, which means uh, allow these uh, these car um, flying above their above their town, above, above their building, much easier than uh, than uh, than others. Um, and then. Um, there's a lot of things that are already existing for a smaller airplane or um, helicopters and as soon as uh, as long as um, the, these new type of vehicle fall into one or two or the other category then it's it's very easy to certify and while it's looking very much like dubai might just be the key city when it comes to the development of the flying car the truth is implementing this technology at scale in any city will require changes to a lot of existing regulations But Andrew Hawkins says embracing this technology might completely change the way we think about transport in our cities. I mean, Dubai is is, is crazy right now in terms of the amount of of money and support that they're throwing at these very outlandish, untested forms of transportation. I mean, you you talk about moonshots they're they're you know they're they're interested in in the hyperloop they're interested in jetpacks uh it, it, you know they're they're really trying to position themselves as being sort of as far out on the fringe in terms of uh technology futuristic technology than any other country uh i've ever seen it's it's really fascinating uh and it, it it's <laughs> could potentially all blow up in their face too when they start having Flying cars and, and fire firefighters on jetpacks and, and Hyperloop all sort of converging over one city. I, don't, I have no idea what that's going to look like. Like, how, how do you see this technology playing out long term in our urban landscape? Yeah, that, I think that's a really good question because um, it, it it is something that uh, cities will have to contend with in the future. I mean, you know. Uh, on one hand, you can see some of the, the validity and the argument from from some of the supporters of this technology who say, oh, you know, cities already allow, most cities already will allow uh, helicopter flights, uh, whether it's for emergencies or for tourism. Uh, it's not too much of a leap to, to, to imagine uh, some of the regulations surrounding helicopters around cities just being modified or extended to include some of these personal uh, aviation uh, uh, vehicles. Uh, but at the other hand, you know, you have to ask yourself, how are these vehicles going to be used? How are these aircraft actually going to be used? What use will they be, they be put towards? Uber envisions a sort of ride hailing network uh, in the sky, sort of akin to what they already have going on on the street level. Uh, but it seems uh, pretty hard to sort of wrap your head around the idea that this is going to be affordable for anyone. And if it's not an affordable form of daily transportation for the masses, I don't see cities really getting on board uh, because they're going to experience a lot of pushback uh, from voters and from residents who will see these things as being sort of, you know, a, a, um, a transportation service for the super rich. Uh, so it will really depend on companies like Uber and others that are uh, actually sort of serving as a platform for any sort of uh, quote unquote flying car service to bring costs down enough to make it affordable for people to uh, uh, sort of open the door uh, to cities uh, uh, and, uh, th- and sort of the approval that they would have to get at a municipal level. And like who is the best place company to to deliver on this sort of technology because there's so many different players and they've got so many different approaches. Yeah, that's that's a great question. I think, you know, sort of, as of right now, I think Uber's interest in this is is really interesting because they're sort of the first company to come along and say, we don't want to be the ones to manufacture or produce these, these aircraft, but we want to be the platform 
uh, uh, through which they're they're actually used for people. Uh, because you can see, you see a number of startups from Volocopter and Lilium in Germany uh, to Aeromobile and uh, you know Terra Fu uh, Fujia and a number of other sort of these small startups that are working in Kitty Hawk in, in California, run by uh, uh, Larry Page, who's formerly like Google. You, you see some of the, a lot of these startups, and they're sort of you know in the the build and development phase where they're they're building these aircraft, they're building sort of at, uh, you know sort of smaller scale prototypes. Um, and trying to sort of wonder how it is that they're actually going to be deployed. Uber has that mechanism to deploy uh, these, uh, uh, these, these aircraft. Now, Palvi say they aren't targeting their product at companies like Uber, and there's still a lot of restrictions in terms of who can drive one. You'll need to have both a driver's license and a pilot's license, and on top of that, you'll need to have insurance for both the ground and the air. But the company is expecting next generation air traffic control systems to help pave the way for new regulations that will help the flying vehicle market grow. Companies like Gravity, implementing an aerial transport system is not something which is on the near horizon. Richard Browning says there's still a lot to do before they can see their jetpack working for a mass market. You only have to go and watch this in person to see that the practicality of what we built for anything other than very specialist applications um, is not there yet. I mean, it consume, consumes four litres of fuel a minute at the moment. Um, you know, it makes a lot of noise and I'm lost in the Iron Man film. It, you know, you can stand right next to me when I take off, but it's uncomfortable. You get a lot of dusty, hot air blown in your face and anything that's not nailed down tends to get moved away. Um, you know, you're not going to take the kids to school or go to shops in this thing anytime soon. I mean, the, the, the potential, though, of technology to evolve and adapt, the potential of uh, electric ducted fans, which we're playing with also, um, and energy storage systems beyond, you know, lithium batteries. I wouldn't want to bet against the potential of human transportation evolving beyond what we see now and maybe towards much more independent personal transportation of the likes of some sort of, you know, personal mobility system. Um, I was going to say the very first cars um, were very unreliable, very inefficient, you know, horrible burdens and beasts that people looked at and thought, well, what's the point of that? I can never see that working. A horse is much easier. Um, you know, so... I, I'm kind of conflicted. You know, my sensible head says, no way, you know, not for the foreseeable future. But my, my more futuristic head says, you know what, the very fact that feels hard to imagine. Uh, and yet we've made so much progress in such a short time. I wouldn't, as I say, bet against it, that, that we'll see some unusual evolutions in personal transportation coming. If you've loved this episode of Moonshot, then head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. And don't forget to share it with your friends. It really helps. Our website is moonshot.audio. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Moonshot Pod. Our cover artwork is by Andrew Millist. And our theme music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. Moonshot is a production of Lawson Media. I'm Christopher Lawson. And I'm Andrew Moon. Join us next time on Moonshot. Moonshot.